Hi all, uh, my name is Pranav Dandekar. I am one of the judges for the Formula Bharat uh, 2021 uh, electric vehicle um, engineering design um, panel. And uh, so now that the, 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 the competition has concluded, we want to do sort of a review of the design uh, <clears throat> to see if there are any sort of high level messages that we can convey to you all as you prepare for um, next year, right? And so a little bit about uh, sort of my background. Um, uh, in my day job, I am building an electric vehicle. Um, we're, I'm, I'm co-founder and CEO of a startup called Wing ZV. Uh, we're building a radically new vehicle for urban commutes in India. And so many of the issues that you, you face, your teams face uh, in, in building the competition vehicle, those are issues that we've dealt with in a slightly different context. And so <clears throat> what I want to do uh, in this design review is instead of going over uh, each individual team or individual finalists uh, um, presentations and, or, or critiquing them, I want to talk about this high level topic, which I think is very central and very important of, of powertrain sizing and component selection, right? And what I wanted to do was, first of all, because we've, we've done this for the vehicle you know, I'm building, uh, and, and secondly, because I've seen uh, a number of various approaches and, and there's always a few things that, that felt like they were missing in, in the reports and analyses that teams submit to us. So I thought uh, it would be helpful if uh, you know, so we, we walk through that. And in, in the process, we will use some of the finalists' um, designs and decisions and analyses uh, as examples, right? So, <clears throat> In my mind, there is a sort of there is a reason why uh, this topic is is sort of very important, right? And and let me sort of step back all the way to the highest level, right? Which is that the goal of this competition, even though it's a competition, the number one goal of this competition is for you to learn, and you to learn by by doing. And the actual winning or losing is only sort of secondary, right? So you you're competing, but but that's not the main goal. Is not not to win. The main goal is, is to learn. And when we as judges are looking for learnings, what we're looking for is uh, consistency of reasoning in the sense that, can you articulate what your goal was? What is it that you set out to do? And do all your subsequent analyses and subsequent decisions, um, are they consistent with your goals, right? And so that ap applies uh, as well to uh, powertrain component sizing and, and selection, right? And so the way I would like to sort of structure this is to say, well, uh, your number one goal, your, your, your number, you know, step one in, 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 in this is to set measurable performance goals or targets for, you know, each event or whatever events you're, you care about, right? So for example, um, team E13, OGIS, uh, right? They, they said, well, our, you know, one of our goals is to complete acceleration event within five seconds, right? Uh, team Octane, which was, I think, E02, they said, well, we would like to achieve 1.2G longitudinal acceleration, right? So, <clears throat> so first of all, start with some measurable goals or targets, right? They may be for the endurance event, for skid pad, for, for acceleration, and so on. But, but they have to be specified in those, in those measurable terms, right? Now, once you have um, these sort of performance goals, then um, the question is, what do what do those goals? What kind of requirements do they impose on your power train, right? So, as a, as an example, imagine if you had an endurance goal of of completing a lap, a single lap, in in some some amount of time, right? Now, if you had that, then the the next natural thing to do is to say, well, if I have to come, you know, if if this vehicle of this weight and so on has to complete this lap in this amount of time. What does it mean for the torque and the RPM that the vehicle has to uh, uh, provide, right? And so uh, a number of teams. So, for example, I think this is a plot from um, the, the you know E13 team also uh, on the on the right and on the left. Um, this is a, a nice heat map along the track from E15, I think, Stallion. And so I think, but but what I did not see, and I think in, in any presentation. Uh, in any analysis, was plotting these two numbers on the sing on on the same plot on, the, on a on a single plot where you plot both the RPM required 
and the torque required to complete your lap, uh, right? In, in, in the amount of time that you set as the goal in step one, right? And, and the, the reason for this is that <clears throat> these two numbers, the, the torque and RPM uh, as a function of time, those will determine the subsequent selection of uh, your power train, right? Which is motor and so on. And so, right? And, and so <clears throat> now let's talk about designing the, the motor, right? So now, now if you have a figure of what torque you need and what RPM you need, then the question is, well, what does your motor and gearbox design have to look like in order to deliver the required torque at the required RPM at all times, right? So often in these presentations or your reports, we saw that there was a lot of discussion of peak torque. Peak torque was like one of the criteria for selecting motors or, or was, was specified everywhere, right? In my mind, peak torque is not nearly as important as saying, well, first of all, now that you have a plot where you have both torque and RPM on the same curve as a function of, on the same plot as a function of time, you should be able to overlay for any given motor plus gearbox, how much torque that motor plus gearbox can deliver at every RPM, at every point in time, right? And the idea should be that um, the motor plus gearbox that you design or you select should at all points have more torque available than what is required, right? So number one, it should have more torque available than, than what is required. Two, there should be a margin of safety or, or some sort of margin. Uh, that margin could be you know, 10%, 15%, whatever it is, but you should be able to justify that margin, right? For example, that margin cannot be 100%, right? I mean, is, right, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't deliver, or you shouldn't have available twice as much torque as is required at all times, right? That would be the definition of sort of over-designed uh, or oversized power train, right? Which we saw a lot of also, including in the finalists, right? So everything that we're, I'm describing here, the finalists did slightly better than other teams, but uh, the finalists in some sense were also, also guilty of sort of over-designing the power train, just saying, Let's, let me just find the, the most powerful motor and just throw it at the problem, right? And I'll describe some of the problems uh, that happen because of that. So, so the idea is that you have the motor plus gearbox, right? And they combined deliver some amount of torque at the at the wheel. And that available torque that they are, they can deliver uh, should be greater than the torque that is required as per your own calculations, right? Now, once you do that, right? Now, now let's talk about. The, the, the choice of motor, right? Now, the, the main thing to remember is you're not selecting the motor first and then design the gearbox later necessarily, right? The, the two things have to go together because it's possible to essentially go with a smaller motor with a higher ratio gearbox, right? Uh, which, might be, which might turn out to be a better selection than a, a more powerful or more higher torque motor with a lower uh, ratio gear. And, and so we'll, we'll see why, right? So with motor selection, like I said, peak torque or peak power is not the most important spec, even though often that's what we saw in the reports as being specified again and again. In my mind, uh, other important specs include things like power to weight ratio, right? You want a motor that is powerful for the, for the weight it has, right? One of your goals should be to reduce the weight of the vehicle and, and uh, you don't want a very heavy motor. Another important criteria uh, for, for choice of motor is what kind of cooling does it require? Cooling will make the motor, um, I mean, the, the sort of your, your uh, sort of assembly more complex. Cooling will also um, suck up more energy, right? So if, if the motor doesn't require cooling or is air cooled versus water cooled, these are things that are important. Right? Um, two other technical things that are important, uh, what's the voltage of the motor, right? And the reason the voltage of the motor matters is there's a trade-off between uh, higher high voltage, low current power train versus a low voltage, high current power train, right? And this is a question that we asked all of the finalists as, as uh, you know, whether they understood the difference and what were the trade-offs and, and why they chose what they chose, right? And so uh, the voltage matters. Another thing that matters is the torque constant. The torque constant is the amount of torque the motor can deliver per unit current, right? And you want a motor with a higher torque constant everything else being equal. Because if, if a motor has a high torque constant, then the same torque can be delivered by lower current. And if the current is low, that means your I square R, R losses are even lower and so 
because losses are proportional to square of the current. And so <clears throat> the, the reason these things are important is because once you fix the motor, that fixes the battery pack voltage and it fixes the battery pack current rating, right? Because the motor runs at a specific voltage, so the battery pack has to provide that voltage. And the motor has uh, current requirements, both continuous and peak, and the battery pack must be, must be able to meet that, right? And so it's not prudent in my mind necessarily to choose a motor, to choose just the most powerful motor you can afford, right? These other things matter. And, and I haven't seen enough um, analysis of um, things like cooling, right? Or things like voltage, right? I mean, I, I didn't see uh, teams analyzing sort of a lower voltage motor versus a higher voltage motor necessarily. Some teams did, and some of them were in the finals, uh, but, but these things matter. In general, uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, for the kinds of power you're looking for, it, it's probably most prudent to choose a voltage, a, a motor that say somewhere between 200 to 400 volts. Some of the teams, including some of the finalists were much higher, including at like 530 volts and so on. And um, that wasn't necessarily, uh, that seemed over designed in some ways. Um, on the other hand, there were also some finalists that had 72 volt power things. So I think Octane has, a 72 volt power tank. And, and there are some fundamental problems with it in the sense of if you have a low voltage, high current power train, then, then there is a whole bunch of uh, consequences of that, which you have to be very aware of, right? And so, um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. And in general, it feels to me, given how sort of, a, you know, it seems like things are over sized or over, over designed, it might be best to use a motor that is a high, that is high voltage, say, you know, somewhere between two and 400 volts, but slightly lower power, right? But it's coupled with a higher gear ratio, right? Or at, at a minimum, you should analyze this possibility. Is can we get a small motor that has lower torque coupled with a high gear ratio? And that small motor, because it's small, uh, needs lower voltage, lower current, and that means lower costs and, and lower losses and higher efficiency, right? So that's something that I think is well worth analyzing. And that's something we would like to see as a as an analysis in your decision to 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 uh, choose or not choose a given motor right. now once your motor is fixed right that sort of determines some of the uh, uh, specifications of your battery pack your accumulator right so for example uh, the motor voltage determines the battery pack nominal voltage if your motor uh, uh, you know will, will deliver that a certain amount of power at say 400 volts so then your accumulator has to be rated for 400 volts, right? Uh, now, once you fix the voltage, <clears throat> you know from your lap simulations, uh, the energy required per lap or energy required for, for any, of the, any of the events, right? And so then that determines the total energy of the pack, right? Again, there has to be some margin of safety. And again, we would like to see you defend or justify that margin of safety. The margin of safety doesn't have to be 100%. Um, the, the reason going back to the sort of the motor constant or the, 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 the torque constant, right, is if you can find a motor that, you know, everything else being equal has a higher torque constant, that means that for the same, to deliver the same torque, the motor will draw lower current. And if it draws less current, then it puts less, you know, smaller requirements on the battery, right? And so <clears throat> there is this trade-off between given your energy, given your voltage, you could either build a small pack with high C rating cells, which is what we saw most of the finalists do. Um, they used uh, cells from Elasta or other places which had continuous ratings of 10 C or peak ratings of up to 15 C, right? Which I imagine are much more expensive, right? The other option is to um, build a battery pack that is slightly larger in capacity in terms of ampere hour, but has lower C rated cells. So only maybe three C or five C rated cells. And um, this is a cost trade-off, right? So, so you could, um, depending on, on whether the, the high C rating cells are more or less expensive, you should decide which to use and that should be in the report, right? So all of these decisions are essentially about why, right? Why did you choose a motor? Why did you choose a cell and so on? And all these have to be justified in the report or in the presentation. Um, <clears throat> the the one, one thing to, to keep in mind is, is a, 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 a couple of the teams in the finals uh, and a number of other teams also had used small cylindrical cells. And then they were doing spot welding of those to, to 
put them into modules and so, so on. And that um, feels like, again, over-engineered or, or needless compared to that, if you use pouch or prismatic cells that are slightly bigger in capacity, then you, either you could just build a 1P uh, pack uh, or you could build a, a pack with a smaller number of Ps, I mean, in, in parallel chains, um, but which are easier to deal with. Potentially, you, you can just bolt the bus bars on them. And so you don't have to worry about spot welding and things like that. So uh, on balance, it might be easier to work with large, uh, um, a small number of large cells rather than a large number of small cells. Um, and then I think finally a couple other points about uh, the battery pack design. One is about thermal and, and the other is about BMS, right? So, so we saw a number of teams had skipped the thermal analysis of, of battery packs and, and they were penalized for, for that, right? Uh, but even the teams that did thermal analysis, they never quite explained why thermal analysis was needed in the first place, right? And so ideally if you're using a higher voltage system, then you don't need a lot of current. So start with a motor that's not very powerful, but is higher voltage. So, so your current is lower. If your current is lower, your I square lo R losses are lower. If your I square R losses are lower, then uh, you don't need, uh, you may not need active cooling. And so first of all, your thermal analysis should describe why you even need cooling. Secondly, which is even sort of more important is there are ways of doing passive cooling uh, in some clever ways, um, which should be analyzed or explored uh, before you jump to some heavy duty active cooling. In some cases, we saw teams using 10 fans, uh, right, to do the cooling and, and consuming something like 80 to 100 watts uh, in the process, right? So there are things uh, around phase change materials. Um, you can consider using thermal pads or gels. You can consider uh, redirecting some of the ambient air into the battery pad uh, in some ways. Um, to to um, do sort of passive cooling without actually having to build an entire system of uh, fans and, and so on, right? The last point was about the BMS used in the battery pack, right? So I think in the finals, there was probably even a distribution of teams that had written their own BMS versus teams that had bought uh, BMSs. I know that even as late as two or three years ago, uh, there weren't a lot of BMSs available in India. And so buying uh, off-the-shelf BMS might not have been a valid option, say, two years ago. But that has changed rapidly. And so at a minimum, uh, if you're going to use your own BMS, uh, it needs some justification as to why you're writing that, that whole thing. right? And, and it's useful to sort of realize that everything that you, you do from scratch that is sort of custom done, it, there's a higher probability of failure. So if you want to make the system more reliable and you want to make it um, sort of easier to, to plug and play, then it's, it's better to go with um, production grade components that are built by um, other companies that you can just buy and plug in, right? As opposed to building things from scratch where then you have to debug and, and it just like makes the system that much more uh, error prone. So if you're going to build your own BMS, you should have uh, sort of good reasons to do that, right? And so I think if you start with your high level goals, break them down into requirements on your powertrain and then break that, those requirements down into requirements on thought and, and, and voltage and current and so on, which then leads to selection of motor and then selection of battery pack and so on. Uh, this, this type of a systematic approach uh, if you can first follow it and secondly explain it in your presentation and in your report and so on, that I think uh, would go a long way. First of all, in for for you to to build a vehicle that is appropriately sized and appropriately sort of selected for, and then also be able to explain and defend those decisions. Right. So I hope this was somewhat useful in um, helping you plan for next year. Um, this is uh, all I had and uh, Godspeed and uh, we'll see you next year.